Good evening. The House has just passed their second impeachment against President Trump. It will now head over to the Senate. However, the Senate is currently in recess. And so the earliest that the trial can actually start is on January the 20th, which is after President Trump's first term is over. And so in theory, the whole thing is actually moot. So why are they doing it? Well, the Democrats are arguing that President Trump can still be impeached even after he's out of office. But is that actually true? Let's go through that together. This is your never ending 2020 election update and I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. So to start with, let's discuss what this impeachment is all about. Well, what it's about is that it's a single article alleging that the president incited an insurrection, which resulted in the breach of the US Capitol on January the 6th. In a speech during the House hearing, House member Jim McGovern from Massachusetts, he described it this way. This was not a protest. This was an insurrection. This was a well-organized attack on our country that was incited by Donald Trump. Now, this impeachment was accomplished in a single session that spanned only several hours, making it the fastest in U.S. history. And as expected, it was pushed through mostly by the Democrats. Now, the Republicans as a whole are criticizing this rushed effort, arguing that it offered no due process to the president and that it would further divide the nation. For instance, House Representative Tom Cole from Oklahoma, he said that, Instead of moving forward as a unifying force, the majority in the House is choosing to divide us further. I can think of no action the House could take that's more likely to further divide the American people than the action we are contemplating today. Now, one reason that he might be saying that is the fact that despite all the blame for what happened at the Capitol building being cast on President Trump by left-wing pundits, by the liberal media, as well as by the politicians, his approval rating has actually remained pretty steady. That's according to a recent Rasmussen poll. And one of the reasons that his approval numbers might not be changing, might be remaining steady, is that there are indeed two sides to the story. Because during a speech, here's what the president actually said. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. That was what the president said right before his supporters marched on the U.S. Capitol. Regardless, the new impeachment alleges that President Trump incited an insurrection. It has now been passed and will now go over to the Senate for a trial. However, right now, the Senate is actually in recess and they are only holding pro forma sessions every three days until January the 19th. And so in order for them to conduct any kind of business before then, including this impeachment trial, they would need to have unanimous consent. And so basically what would need to happen is that all 100 U.S. senators would need to agree to begin the impeachment trial early, which likely won't happen. Almost, there's almost a 0% chance of that happening. And so the trial will only likely start on January 19th or even more likely January the 20th. So then the big question is this. Can President Trump actually be tried once he is out of office? Well, according to Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz, he can't. That's because according to him, the Constitution specifically says the president shall be removed from office upon impeachment. It doesn't say the former president. Congress has no power to impeach or try a private citizen, whether it be a private citizen named Donald Trump or named Barack Obama or anyone else. Basically, that interpretation would mean that the case would be moot beyond January the 20th. Regardless, in light of the way that the courts have been interpreting laws as of late, we can't be sure of that. We can't be sure of anything, honestly. And this question might very go well up all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, in terms of why the Democrats might be pushing so hard for impeachment at all, when we're just maybe a week out from January the 20th, well, that might be because once impeached, President Trump will not be able to run for any office again in this country. So let's see how it all plays out in the coming days. If you'd like to read more about this impeachment, those links will be in the description box below this video for you to check out for yourself. And while you're down there looking for those links, take a quick second to smash that like button. Right now, videos like this are being censored by all the big tech platforms, including this one right here. And so when you smash that like button below this video, you are fighting back against the censorship. You are forcing the YouTube algorithm to share this video out to potentially thousands of more people and let the truth be known far and wide. Now let's talk a bit more about what will happen on January the 20th. A few days ago, President Trump approved an emergency declaration in Washington, D.C. Basically what happened was that the Washington, D.C. mayor requested for more support from the National Guard ahead of January the 20th, and President Trump agreed to it. 
In a statement that was released by the White House, President Trump declared that an emergency exists in the District of Columbia and ordered federal assistance to supplement the district's response efforts due to the emergency conditions resulting from the 59th presidential inauguration. And in so saying, up to 15,000 National Guard troops will have authorization to be deployed in the city until January the 23rd. And so that means Washington, D.C. will have a very thick and heavy military presence. Furthermore, the mayor of D.C. urged people to not even travel to Washington, D.C. for the presidential inauguration and instead to take part in the January 20th event virtually. Advice that I suspect a lot of people will take. Now, if you'd like to read more about this emergency declaration or about the National Guard troops being deployed, those articles will be in the description box below this video for you to check out. And now, I'd like to try something a little bit new today. There are a lot of stories happening every single day that might be not significant enough to warrant an entire segment on our show, but I'd still like to tell you a bit more about them. And so what I'm going to do today is in smaller, more bite-sized uh, news segments, we'll go through them. And then if you want to go deeper, all the links will be in the description box below this video. So let's start with things that are happening nationally inside of America. CNN, they just announced that they will no longer be broadcasted in airports, which is actually pretty significant because if you've traveled anywhere in the last 30 years, you know that CNN had basically a monopoly on airport TV. In fact, according to contracts that were recently published online, CNN has been paying airports to run exclusively their programming. They had deals with 58 airports, which had been running their content live 24 hours a day. Now, the official reason for this change is that there are just not as many people in airports as there used to be. In a letter from Jeff Zucker, who is CNN's president, he wrote that, The steep decline in airport traffic because of COVID-19, coupled with all the new ways that people are consuming content on their personal devices, has lessened the need for this CNN airport network. It's not yet been made public what airports will instead use to fill up that airtime. Now, while we're on the topic of talking about the media, let's talk about PBS as well. A recent undercover video released by Project Veritas showed PBS's principal counsel, their principal lawyer, railing against Trump supporters and even supporting violence if President Trump won the election. Take a look. Anyone buy the wings? And Homeland Security will take the children. Come back. And we'll put them into re education camps. Amen. And these times, which are unique. Any other questions? It's close to him. What are we going to do if we don't like it? Go to the White House and throw Molotov cocktails. Wow. So the man in that video, according to his LinkedIn profile, he is a former National Geographic vice president who has worked for PBS over the past seven years. And it says that his job responsibilities included providing strategic and day-to-day -day legal and business advice, analyzing content rights and information, and negotiating content production. Now, as of yesterday, PBS released a statement saying that this lawyer is no longer employed by them. In the statement, they wrote that, this employee no longer works for PBS. As a mid-level staff attorney, he did not speak on behalf of our organization, nor did he make any editorial decisions. There is no place for hateful rhetoric at PBS, and this individual's views in no way reflect our values or opinions. Now let's head over to Florida, where 71 people were arrested in a human trafficking sting ahead of the Super Bowl that's coming up in Tampa. And that was the result of a month-long undercover sting operation called Operation Interception. Basically, what they did was that over the course of a month, undercover detectives posted ads online offering to meet up for sex with female detectives also posing as sex workers. Now, according to the sheriff, all 71 of these suspects were male and were aged between 20 and 62 years old. Among those arrested, there were several active duty military personnel, a firefighter, a Christian school teacher, a banker, several construction workers, as well as several local business owners. The sheriff noted that all of these men have one thing in common. They did not care if the women they were going to have sex with were being exploited, forced to sell their bodies against their will. Now, this successful sting operation is actually part of a larger fight against human trafficking that has been pushed forward by the Trump administration over the past four years. In fact, since taking office, President Trump has made fighting human trafficking a top listed priority. One year ago, he signed an executive order directing more resources towards eliminating human trafficking as well as online child exploitation. 
And besides that, there has been an initiative of a multi-agency anti-trafficking coordination team, which has more than doubled the convictions of human traffickers in targeted hotspots. And so that's obviously very good news. And I believe that everybody in this country, regardless of their political affiliation, hopes that this kind of effort will continue into the future. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what's happening around the world. Let's start over in Kyrgyzstan. A few days ago, they elected a new president. The man's name is Zatur Zaparov. He is a nationalist. He won by a huge margin, 79%. And of note, he was recently serving prison time for his involvement in overthrowing the previous Kyrgyzstani president. Because it was claimed at that time that his party, the previous administration's party, was actually rigging the vote. Now, if you've ever served overseas, you might know that formerly Kyrgyzstan was the site of an American airbase that served as a key transport hub for our war in Afghanistan. However, nowadays, in terms of their alliances, Kyrgyzstan is actually allied with Russia, both economically as well as security-wise. They depend heavily on Moscow's economic support, and currently they host a Russian airbase inside of their borders, inside of Kyrgyzstan's borders. And now let's go over to Iran. The Iranians aren't only having diplomatic issues with America at the moment. Recently, a South Korean oil tanker was seized by Iran's Revolutionary Guard while it was sailing through the Strait of Hormuz. Now, both the ship and the crew are currently being held captive, and there are about 20 people who are on board. Now, the official reason that was given by Iran for why they seized the ship was because of the oil tanker's environmental pollution. However, the owner of the ship says that that's not the case, and Iran has not provided any actual evidence to back up their claim. So what's really going on here? Well, for a bit of context, to give you a bit more context, Iran has a record of using this tactic of seizing ships that are traveling through the Strait of Hormuz in order to get a little bit of advantage in their sanctions talk. So in regards to this oil tanker, this whole affair comes at a time when Iranian officials have been pressing South Korea to release about $7 billion worth of assets that are currently frozen, that are tied up in Korean banks due to the sanctions. And people right now are speculating that Iran sees this oil tanker in order to give them a bit more leverage in their negotiations with the Koreans. And along that line, a few days ago, a diplomatic delegation from South Korea traveled to Iran in order to negotiate the release of the vessel, the release of the crew, as well as to work out these financial disputes. Now, thus far, I haven't heard of any developments that have come out of this meeting, but I'm keeping my ears open. If you want to read more, it'll be in the description box below. Now let's head over to China. Just when you thought that the communist disregard for human life couldn't get lower, it does. State-run Chinese media published an article recently bragging about new helmets that were given out to the troops that are serving in Tibet. Now, what's so cool about these helmets? Well, they are equipped with a self-destruct button. Let me just repeat that for you in case you missed it. These soldiers are being issued helmets that have on them a self-destruct button. When you press the button, there's a bomb that's embedded in the helmet that goes off and kills the soldier. Now, this helmet is actually part of a system that the soldiers are equipped with. The system includes a video camera, which allows headquarters to see what's happening on the ground with the soldier. It includes a two-way radio so that the headquarters can listen in on what's happening with the soldier as well as issue orders. And it includes this self-destruct button in case things go awry. According to this report, if a soldier is seriously wounded and doesn't want to be captured, he can activate the self-destruct function himself. This can maintain his dignity as well as prevent the enemy from obtaining the system. Now, however, the soldier is not the only one who can activate the self-destruct function. This report also reads that at a battalion or brigade level command center, a commander monitors a soldier who is far away by using the navigation system. The commander can activate the self-destruct function of the soldier's helmet if he can get in contact with him. Gosh, can you even imagine that? So what's the real reason for these helmets? Well, a China expert that we hear at the Epic Times we interviewed, he said that these helmets are further evidence of the fact that the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military, is struggling to manage its soldiers, to keep them from disobeying, and to keep them from deserting. In fact, over the last three years, the Chinese regime has been using increasingly severe punishment for deserters, such as banning them from public transportation, banning them from attending school, from working in government positions, or from even applying for passports. And now, they will be forced to fight, or otherwise, they will be killed by their commander. In my opinion, there is no better metaphor than this for what a communist country is. In a communist country, a person is monitored, he is tracked, he is controlled, and he can be disposed of at any time. 
Now, if you'd like to read more about these helmets or about any of the stories that we discussed, those links will be in the description box below this video for you to check out. That description box, by the way, is the one right below that like button that I hope that you have already smashed. And now lastly, I'd like to tell you a bit more about our show sponsor, American Hartford Gold. And I'm going to do that over in the sound studio. All right, yes, today's sponsor is American Hartford Gold. So again, I have no business giving anyone investment advice, but I will tell you what I do. And for the last um, probably four and a half years, I, every single month, try to buy gold and silver. I just basically set aside a portion of my salary and I buy physical gold and silver. Because I was turned into some uh, research directions which showed me that when you look at a timeline of the last 5,000 years, fiat currencies, basically like paper money, has always gone to zero right? Basically, it, the government's printed, it degrades in value, then they inflate it, then it goes into hyperinflation, and then it collapses when basically no one, uh, no one believes in it anymore. And right now is a time when the Federal Reserve is, is uh, printing or, or digitally printing or buying up assets willy-nilly, and our money is getting degraded. Basically, it's becoming less and less, um, it's becoming worthless in a, in a certain sense. But I believe that gold and silver, it had value 5,000 years ago, it has value today, and I, you know, this is not investment advice again, but it likely have 5,000 uh, value 5,000 years into the future. And so our sponsor today is American Heart for Gold. They sell physical gold and silver uh, that can be delivered directly to your doorstep, or they can put it directly into your IRA account, making it super simple for you to have it. Uh, now you can uh, check them out. Their link will be in the description box below this video. Uh, you can uh, buy from them, and they offer a free PDF book that you can learn more about investing in gold and silver. You can check it out in the link below. And they also want me to give you their phone number. It's 866-242-2352. Again, that's 866-242-2352. I'll throw it in the description box as well. Or if you want to text them, um, you can text the word Roman, my name, to 65532. Again, Roman to 65532. So thank you, American Heart for Gold. Thank you so much for sponsoring our episode. And now Roman in the studio, back to you. Now lastly, if you haven't already, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you want more honest news content delivered directly to your YouTube. Now lastly, if you haven't already, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you'd like honest news content delivered directly to your YouTube feed. And actually, if you'd like to go over to theepictimes.com, you can subscribe to our news content there. That way, in case anything ever happens on any of these social media platforms, you can stay informed without any interruption and without any threat of censorship. And until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.